<laughs> Is this recording okay? Yes. Okay, cool. So, yeah, okay, yeah, I gotta stand up definitely. So, hi, my name is Chris Connie Beer. Um, like Katie said, I currently work for Integrum. I'm a uh, .NET developer, and my title is Captain Blue Screen. And it comes up all the time about uh, my life. I used to be a chef. And uh, Katie asked me if I would get up here and uh, talk to everybody today about what the life was like as being a chef and how I made the transition over to where I am today. And it's kind of weird because it takes me back a, a long way because I started, I'm 35 now, and I started in kitchens when I was about 16 years old uh, back in Columbus, Ohio. And at that point, it was, it was really tough for me to get through high school because I had this, uh, I had this, uh, it's some attention deficit disorder problems. I had uh, uh, anger issues, all kinds of other things. So typical schooling wasn't really working out for me. And I was actually already writing programs then when I was a kid. I got my first computer when I was seven years old. <clears throat> And my mom was a, a single mother raising me by herself in Columbus, Ohio. My grandparents were helping out and everything. And uh, one time when finances were getting a little tight, when it got close to summer vacation, my mom said, hey, do you mind making sandwiches for yourself during lunch instead of like walking to Daddy's or some other place to go pick up lunch during summer vacation? And this is junior high school. So uh, I said, yeah, sure, I'll start, I'll start cooking. And next thing I know, I started making my own like uh, sandwiches and I started making like pasta salads and stuff like that at home for myself so that way I would cook for my mom. Well, then she said, well, why don't you give Chinese food a, a try? And I said, sure, I'll try Chinese food. And I mean, I think I was 14 at the time or whatever. So she ordered off TV this hand hammer walk thing that they had. And sure enough, I just started cooking. I started getting cookbooks and I started falling in love with cooking. And that was my way to get through high school because I couldn't go through traditional classes. I went into a vocational school where for my junior and senior year, I would work in a kitchen and then do half day school work. And then I would leave and go work in a restaurant professionally during the second half of my day. Well, I had been held back a year, so by the time I got to my senior year, I was already 18 years old, so I could do full cooking in the kitchen because there's a lot of laws surrounding what a miner can do. You can't use like steam jacket kettles, you can't use knives, you can't use a lot of the equipment there because it's pretty, pretty dangerous. So being 18, it put me in a unique position that instead of working at like a McDonald's or something like that, which a lot of the other kids were doing during their senior year, I actually started working in a professional Italian restaurant. It was a small Italian restaurant that was owned by uh, uh, Mr. Scali, um, he came over from uh, came over from Italy, like when he was 20 or 30 years old, and he had lived here his entire life. And he got his son together, and they started this little restaurant called Scali's Italian Restaurant in Columbus. Well, I started falling in love with it even more. Started getting into learning how to make pastas from scratch, learning how to make uh, lobster raviolis, gnocchis, all, all kinds of things around around Italian food. And Italian food was really what got me excited about cooking because it was like Mexican food in the fact that it's only five or six ingredients. You have you have tomatoes, you have garlic, you have olive oil, you have capers. You know, you, you have you have these core ingredients, and we would do so many different dishes with it um, that it was really interesting to me because it is similar to what I do today. It was about taking um, these ingredients that you see every day and just combining and using them in different ways to make hundreds of different dishes. So during my senior year, um, I actually was working there and then I found out I got offered a job from another company, a restaurant company. They had actually already heard about me um, doing this apprenticeship program or whatever whatever they were calling it. It was called uh, some kind of workman's, workman's con, not compensation, but a workman's program. And they asked me to come work for them as a prep cook and uh, um, as a fry cook. So that was how I got started in an upscale restaurant. It was a place called Gottlieb's East. It was back in Columbus, Ohio. And it was for a restaurant company that ran six different restaurants locally. Well, they also ran fine dining and a classical French restaurant. And at this point, I'm what, 18, 18 and a half years old. And I started working there. And I started really getting into the intricacies of being a chef. I started learning how to make my own stock. Started learning about making... Um, cutting down fillets, cutting down fish, because we would get in whole fish and we would have to cut it all down for portions every night, <clears throat> make all our stocks every three or four days from scratch. So at the age of 18 and a half, 19 years old, I was already learning classical French training from the chef I was working for. His name was uh, Fred, uh, Fred Deba DeBazio? I, I can't remember his name. Wendy got to meet him, what, Chef Fred. That's what everybody called him, was Chef Fred. 
And uh, so at that time at 18 and a half, um, I actually got to where I got to do an internship. So I was able to do a French internship. And I went away, I did that for a couple months, came back, and by the time I was 19, 19 and a half, 19 after I graduated from high school, I got promoted to sous chef, which is if, if you're lear wanting to know more about the way that the kitchen works, you have an executive chef who's in charge of everything in the kitchen, you have a general manager who's in charge of the entire restaurant, but underneath the executive chef, you generally have sous chefs which is S-O-U-S, -S. and what Sue means is second. So these are the second chefs. These are ones that's second in charge. So right, out of, right, out, right after my training and out of high school, I got to open up a restaurant as a day, or nighttime sous chef. Nighttime sous chefs are usually the guys that go in and have to take all the brunt of all the yelling and everything from everybody else. You're responsible for doing all the orders at the end of the night, so after everybody's cleaned up at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, you're the one that has to walk through the coolers and inventory every single product that you have in there call in the fish order for the next day, call in the meat orders for the next day, produce, do Abbott dry good orders, things like that, and also make do a prep list for the next day because you go through and you count how much, how much stock is there, how much uh, marinara is there, how much uh, demi-glace is there, how much uh, Creole sauce has been prepped and ready. So you go through and you count all that and you actually come up with a prep list for the next day. So when the cooks come in at six o'clock in the morning, they've got a, they've got a a sheet already done for them that lists everything that needs to get cooked for that day to cover um, dinner service and lunch service. And you actually would star items. If uh, your Creole sauce is really low, you'd start to say that this is a, this is an item that's going to be 86, which means we're out of it. It's an item that's going to be 86 for lunch if you don't make it first. So the guys come in the morning, they take your prep lifts and everything, and they start, they start cooking away. Um, so I spent about a year, I think it was, working as uh, the nighttime sous chef. And then I had a chance where we had a chef that actually up and quit, executive chef up and quit at another one of our properties. And at 20 years old, I got promoted to executive chef, which at 20 years old was really cool. But it was also really weird because for anybody that hasn't worked in restaurants, there's a habit of a lot of drinking and things like that. Um, and it's not that that's what it's all about, but that's kind of what you do at night. When you get off in your nighttime sous chef, you get off at midnight, one o'clock. What do you do? You go to a bar, you go to somebody's house and you have some drinks and then you get up and do it the next day. So next thing I know, I was executive chef. I was 20 years old. And being executive chef, it's so much more than just cooking. Um, being in charge of a kitchen is, especially at that age, I look back at it now and it was so weird because you're responsible for all the food cost. So generally when you go into a restaurant and you order something off of a menu, you know, you may see a steak on a menu for $19.95 or something like that. Um, the food cost is actually what you pay of that total price towards the actual food on there. So across your entire menu, when you're developing a menu as executive chef, you have to actually maintain a consistent food cost in order to make money. Um, so for steaks, let's say a food cost is usually 40 to 45% because beef is one of the most expensive pieces of meat that you can serve on something, but then you'd make up tons of it by selling, you know, shitloads of pasta at night because pasta, sorry, pardon my language, pastas at night are 11% because a lot of times people come in and they want shrimp pasta. Well, you throw in six shrimp, you throw in a crap load of pasta, make this huge gist, charge $14.95, and that's how you make up the points to be able to have an average food cost menu of like 23 to 25%. Usually when you go through the entire menu and look at a menu in a place, it's gonna be 23 to 25%, depending on the clientele and what they're, what they're specializing in, is, is what the general food cost is. So one, I had to start developing menus. I had to start learning how to you know, take recipes and I'd already done this as, opening, uh, as an opening sous chef because we developed the entire menus from scratch, but also and I was the guy that was responsible for rewriting the entire menu. Because first thing that happened when I took over executive chef there is they decided they wanted to transform the place from Nichols Grill to Cafe 55. And what they wanted to do is they wanted a whole new menu, they wanted new staff, they wanted new prep recipes and everything. So as executive chef, you have to do that. You have to cost out every single thing. Being that we were in a company where we had six restaurants, I had to take them in front of the corporate executive chef who is a CIA grad, sorry, CIA is Culinary Institute of America. That's basically the, the holy grail. If you're, if you're in the business and you want to learn to be a chef, uh, CIA is probably by far the, the highest accredited school that you can go to for being a chef here in the U.S. Um, 
So he was a CIA grad and everything, and he would pick me apart on every single thing. I'll never forget the first time I had to cook for uh, Chef Hollenbeck when I was like 18 years old. I'm cooking saute stations where I learned this. But you would actually put a dish up, and he would keep a span. Uh, uh, a uh, pan of spoons next to it when you put up a dish and he'd grab it he'd take a little taste of it and if it didn't have enough salt he'd throw a spoon hit me in the leg and tell me there's not enough salt in this or if you know there was too much pepper he'd throw a spoon and let me know that there's not there's not a, there's too much pepper in this so that's the way that you that's that's the way that you learn you see all these cooking shows where it's like screaming and yelling and you know constant fighting in a kitchen not too far from the truth um, that, that's about the way it is working in especially in a classical French brigade kitchen where you have stations set up and People have very specific responsibilities on what they do on plates. And I'll talk a little bit more about French Brigade here in a little bit because I also did fine dining. Um, so you're, you're responsible for food costs, you're responsible for keeping, making sure prep lists are done, making sure recipes are done. Then comes labor costs. Next thing I know, I'm 20 years old and I'm managing, I think it was like 25 to 30 people that were working for me in the kitchen. Because we would have a, roughly 15 people that would be working the line. The line is where you get your broil station, your fry station, your saute station, pantry station, dessert station, where all the food comes from. And then usually we keep about 10 prep cooks and also a couple dish tankers, but they would come and go and we would share them with other restaurants and everything. But uh, so I had about 25 people working for me. I was responsible for all that. And then you also have to report to the general manager. So when reporting to the general manager, you have to worry about your small your small wares costs. You know, all those plates and all the silverware and everything that you use when you go into a restaurant. The amount of money that is spent on that when a restaurant opens up is just ridiculous. A, a small wares order, I've seen one that was a quarter of a million dollars for opening a restaurant. That was just that was just serving goods to be able to put on a plate and be able to take everything out to the tables and all the silverware and all the wine glasses and everything. So um, so I, I did that for a while and then I got pretty good at doing the openings and doing the menus. Well, next thing I know, I got moved to another property and at that property went through the exact same thing. By this time, I'm like 21, 22 years old. And then uh, the company I worked for started having some issues and I decided I want to get out of working for that company. So then I went to work for a classical French restaurant in Columbus, Ohio, which was called The Refectory. And this was a true classical French brigade kitchen and the fact that we would have 12 to 15 people cooking on a line at night and we would only serve about 100 to 105 dinners. But on average, these dinners were probably 25 to, I think some of the, some of the filet and fish dinners that we would do were 65 to $70 for a plate. And that was, you know, very French. Everything there was done French. It's like if you've ever seen mashed potatoes done with a sieve, where you work it through a sieve and then you put in more butter and put it through a sieve, we would do our mashed potatoes through a sieve about seven or six, seven or eight times. And for like every five pounds of mashed potatoes, I think there was like three and a half pounds of butter. So I mean, it's like some of the worst, some of the worst food for you, but it was some of the best tasting food that we ever did. But in a classical French brigade kitchen, it's a lot different in the fact that on both sides, we had a fish side and we had a meat side. And the way that this worked is all the way at the very end were what we called the sides. And the sides were the people that did all the vegetables because when it came to like our potatoes and it came to all of our asparagus and also we would do uh, hair covers, um, which are the real small green beans that you see out there, the real skinny ones that are super tender. Every single one of those we would actually cut each potato by hand. And we would, we would actually do torp torpedo shapes out of them and you would get six of them out of potatoes. So those guys on the in, when an order would come in, the first thing they do is they're grabbing potatoes. That boring? Wow. Um, <laughs> So they, they would actually be doing everything by hand and working it in a center. And then you would have two guys on the inside of those and they, they would do nothing but cook meat or cook fish. And then inside of there, there were two more guys who were our sauciers for both sides. And they would both do little individual pots of every single sauce that we did for each, for each plate. So each plate would take 25 to 30 minutes and it would actually just work its way down the line. The veggie guys would call out starting veggies, fish meat guy would be like, I'm firing fish or I'm firing meat. And the sauciers in the center we give them like a two or three minute heads up on when meat's coming out and they would get the sauces ready and put together. And then the chef would sit on the other side and you'd throw the plates up and he'd go over with a magnifying glass, look at everything and send it out. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the way the classical French Brigade kitchen works. And it's, it's one of the best experiences I had in my life. It was also one of the most stressful because in a classical French Brigade kitchen, the chef doesn't come up with the recipes for the day. Basically, we would get in and we work salary there. We would get in at about seven o'clock, eight o'clock 
o'clock in the morning because we didn't do a lunch. We would do a small lunch service if we were doing it. I think that was only like Thursdays and Fridays we did lunch service. But we'd get in like seven or eight o'clock in the morning. You don't leave till nine, 10 o'clock at night. And that's a standard day, but you're salaried also because they treat you that way. They're like, if you want to be here working in this kitchen, you have to sacrifice in order to learn from Chef Blondin was the guy that I was working for at the time. But every day when you came in, there'd be a sheet of paper, hand scratch, hand, you know, scratch written from, uh, from the chef and he was French and he could barely speak a lick of English and hardly wrote English sometimes too. So it was like really horrible trying to read this, but he would, he would list, we got five pieces of turbo left over and we've got a pound of, you know, black bear bacon or something like this. And he'd be like, you get all that and you have to come up with specials. So then you would sit there and you would start prepping and working on specials and about noon, you would go to the chef and you go, chef, here's what I've come up with for the day. And he'd be like, I want to taste the sauce. So then you go back and you start making the sauce from scratch because you would just lay out ideas and recipes kind of thing. <clears throat> so then usually about one, two o'clock, you would go in and you would start serving the chef and he would make any changes to it. And then you were responsible for running that special that night. So every single day when you came in, you had this responsibility of basically running. And the way I looked at it was my own small business because I would get so many ingredients and I would have to come up with some of the best recipes I could and also with good food costs. So that way we could run in and make money off this and make sure we don't throw away food. Um, so I went through all that for a couple years and then I went to work at another place called Liberty Restaurant which ended up getting tanked by the owners. They started uh, Friday nights we would do um, $30,000 worth of business and we would come in on Mondays and all the credit cards receipts were gone because they would come in first thing Monday when the money was getting put in the accounts and they would wipe it out. And I was getting kind of sick of dealing with the business and everything by that point. I think I was like 24, 25 years old. and. Uh, I decided that's when it's time to make a career change. So I ended up uh, up and paying off a ton of bills and uh, decided I was going to go into computers because that's what I always wanted to do for a living. And at the age of 25, left the job that I'd been at there for a while and started working as a tech support rep for I think like $9 an hour for a company called Winbook Computers. And then went through and got to where I am now as a developer today. So that's kind of a little bit of the history on where I got from there to there. Um, now, like Katie said, I, I, I kind of came up for this and said I, I'm more than willing to come up here and talk about being a chef. It's kind of tough for me to talk openly about it because it's been so long. It's been like 10, 12 years since I've been doing it, so it's kind of out of my mind. I want to open up right now. Katie gave me some questions, but I wanted to open up to you guys any questions that you had about the restaurants and kitchens and what, what, what's involved there. And it can even be um, about opening restaurants because I did a lot of the financials and everything during my time. Yes, sir. Chuck. So for, for ordering, the way that it works out is that you pay so close attention to your counts. Um, we do trending on counts. So every day, every night when I would go through the kitchen or if, if it was my sous chef, once I was executive chef, I had the other guys that did it. Every single night you go through the kitchen and you count every single thing that you have. I mean, literally like two cases of lettuce, uh, one case of romaine, two bat, you know, two 10 pound boxes of spinach because we did a, we did a, a special lettuce blend. And that was always one of the big things because lettuce, you don't want to keep on hand too long. Um, what you start doing is you keep track of your cover counts and then you keep track of how much of each of that you go through. And you really do learn quickly how much it takes, how much lettuce you'll serve to feed, you know, five, 600 covers in a day. And a cover is just one person coming in and setting down. And you start trending that data. And after you've been open for about three to four weeks, you can really see the patterns and learn how much to bring in and how much, how much to have on hand. Um, that's one thing that kills a lot of restaurants is that they, they over order on their food too much because they're afraid of running out. And you, it's, it's a fine line that you have to walk. You really have to pay attention to how many resos you have for a night, what the cover counts have been for the week, what's been going on in the city. Uh, one of the restaurants I worked at was called 55 on the Boulevard downtown and we were right across from a convention center. And for us, one Monday could be 400 covers because it was, it was a fine dining restaurant. So between lunch and dinner, we may do 400 covers. But when the Long and Burger girls were in town, we would do like 13, 1400 covers in that same time frame. So you really have to pay attention to that. But we also knew with the Long and Burger, they always split salads. So even though we would do like 1400 covers, Covers, we would still only sell as many salads as doing 500 because no, all, all, they would always come in and be like a split salad, dressing on the side, onion on the side, and two glasses of water. You know, that, that, that was about the way it ran. So, but yeah, it's just trending. I mean, you really just pay attention to what you've got coming in and going out and you trend it. And you get, and if you care, 
if, if you're doing a good job at it, you won't 86 a lot of food, but you have to also be prepared to say that on some of the, the ingredients that may go bad, you know, quicker on you, and that's a lot of money. Like if you keep morels on hand, or uh, we did foie gras appetizers, if you keep foie gras on hand, it doesn't keep for that long. So I'm willing to 86 that, because I'd rather 86 it towards the end of, end of dinner service than have it left over for the next day and have something that's gonna taste like crap because it's been sitting in my cooler for too long, so. Anybody else have questions? Go for it, Katie. I got your list up here. But I, I told you I have time. That's fine. So, what's, I mean, how much interaction is there between, I mean, we work with, we know Chad from mm -hmm. Murphy's, but that's kind of an unusual relationship to have him come out as much as he does. What's the interaction between a chef and the patrons? And what's the most annoying thing dealing with patrons as a chef? Um, so, I actually have two sides to the interactions with the patrons because I've worked in establishments where a kitchen was in the back and you didn't really get to see it. Um, when I was doing like Gottlieb's where it was like a upscale casual kind of thing, I would walk the floor as a sous chef or as a chef because I would, all, I would always go out and walk the floor and see how many people were waiting up by the hostess stand and things like that, see what's going on if tables are flipping and burning. Um, but also I'd walk around and ask people. A lot of chefs don't like to do that. A lot of chefs don't really get out on the floor and walk around and talk to people. I started to learn real early in my career that when I did that, people want to come back. Even if, it's just, even if they're just ordering a pasta dish and I come up and go, hey, how's your pasta dish today people really love to have that interaction now that was with a closed kitchen now a place I the Nichols Grill and Cafe 55 which I worked at we literally had an open kitchen and the fact that there was no wall and it was carpet and then tile and then here was my line so when you're when you're working a line as a line cook you're on the other side cooking on the broil station saute station whatever but the chef is generally working what's called the expediter the expo and he's on the other side of it and he calls out the tickets and then he puts it all together stacks he orders up calls for runners so it can get out to the table well that I literally could turn around and if there was a table behind me, I could literally grab food and I would serve people. If, 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 if I had the time to, I'd pull that off. I loved working that interaction because people all the time would be watching what was going on back in the lines and they'd come up and they'd tap me and ask me questions. Awesome. Love doing that. Um, the one biggest pain I think when it comes to dealing with, uh, with people, uh, patrons wise, was always parties. I always hated dealing with parties when 15, 16 people come in and they order a whole slew of everything on the menu and then expect it to still be on 10 minutes just like the table next to them. It's really tough to do, especially if you have broiled goods, saute goods, fry goods. You're trying to coordinate 16 dishes across three different, you know, three different stations on the line. And also, um, people not understanding that sauces and things like that already pre-made. People would want to come in and they would want a special order of Creole jambalaya or something like that and they'd want us to take all the tomatoes out or take all the celery out and things like that. People in special orders was really one of the biggest pains. Um, and also um, not, not being harsh to the waitresses when we screwed up. That was one time when I would always go out to the table. If we, you know, it was all about paper-based tickets. You had a printer that would go off all day long printing up tickets and you're calling them out. Well, every now and then I might grab one, put it up and it falls off and slides underneath and I forget about it for 10 minutes because all of a sudden my saute cook's yelling at me going, why, why do I have an extra, you know, why do I have an extra dish up here when, when you called it to me and now you're not asking for it? Why did I waste this food and you wasted my time? Um, and then people would start exploding on the waitresses. So that's when I would always go out to the floor and go, listen, it's not their fault. Because people take some of that out on the waitresses and the waiters, and that's their tips, that's their money, that's how they're making money. When food's coming slow, generally it's not the waiter or waitress's fault, it's a fault of the kitchen. If your steak's miscooked, it's, it's probably the kitchen's fault. You know, a lot of that gets taken out on the waiters and waitresses. I, don't, I think that people don't appreciate enough what they do, so. Um, so he would always, there was always a couple, so the way that the menu worked at Refectory was, is we had, a, I think it was a 30% core menu or 40% core menu, and then the other 60% was a daily menu. So we would literally print our menus every single day and put them in there. Um, each station would have a couple dishes, like I would have, a, if I was working fish side, I would get two pieces of fish, two different kinds of fish, meat side, we get two or three kinds of meat, and then chef would always take some stuff that he wanted to play with. So he would still be developing recipes, but they were usually 
the stuff that he's interested in trying something new or it's something that's, you know, when, when you're doing like lobster stocks and things like that, that was always kind of things that they would want, the chef would a lot of times want to do themselves because they were, they were afraid if you were sauteing up lobster shells, you would basically burn up a whole box. And you know, when you burn up 50 pounds of lobster shells, it's quite a bit of lobster, that's quite a bit of money you're burning through. So they, they would still take care of those kind of things. And also cutting down meat. Cutting down meat is generally handled by the chefs on the more expensive meats because you're afraid of waste. Um, and also they would be, he would be doing all the, or, checking all the orders for the day and making sure that we have all the stuff that we need. So there's still a lot of a lot of interaction by the chef, but it's mainly management during the day. You know, they'll, they'll do two to three recipes or something like that, but generally they're managing the kitchen and also making sure that the kitchen's adhering to a standard. That, that's one of the biggest jobs as executive chef is walking around checking everything. And I don't care if it's shredded Parmesan cheese, making sure that it's shredded the same way every single time so you have a consistent experience. That's, that's a lot of what the executive chefs do. Moving around on you. <laughs> Anybody else got questions? Yeah, Debbie. I've often been told that you don't send food back to the kitchen or it comes back with extra stuff on it that you don't want. <laughs> but I have difficulty getting a steak right. I never say, I want it medium rare, boom, I want it medium rare. And I, no matter where you go into, it's always different and wrong. Yeah. Um, remember EVFN about a, oh. six months ago where I sent back three steaks in one night? It felt horrible. Um, it, some of that stuff does happen. I mean, I. I'm not gonna say that I condone it or I ever did it or anything like that, but there are, I'll never forget that we had a prime rib and prime ribs are a pre-cooked, you know, you, you pre-cook an entire prime rib. And we had some guy that basically sent it back three times saying it wasn't well done enough. And I mean, this thing you couldn't even cut into. So we ended up taking it, throwing it in the fryer and we fried a $25 piece of meat until it had nothing left on it. And then out of sheer hatred, we threw it against the wall and it fell onto the flat top so we could get all the fried juice off of it. It, it, people don't necessarily add stuff all the time to, you know, that doesn't happen that much, but there is some anger that goes on in the back, especially when somebody's being unreasonable and the poor waitress is coming back almost in tears. You know, I've never actually sat there and like, you know, done stuff to people's food on purpose, but you don't treat it the nicest. You aren't throwing it on a floor or anything like that, but you're definitely not making sure that it's the best piece of, you know, best cooked dinner. Cause at that point, they're not going to be happy and they're already going to want their money back. And then they're going to, if it comes back once, I'm willing to help you out. We, we probably screwed up. Maybe, maybe there's a difference in regions because you'll get people from the south that when they say well done steak compared to what you see out here well done, it's two completely different things. So if it comes back once, I never, we would never do anything. We would never be upset. Screw ups happen, you know, and people, people have differing tastes on things. But when you get down to literally a third time of something coming back, that's when you start to, you know, it, we, we had one time, uh, I, think I, was, I think it was right when I was like 18 or 19, we had some guy who came in and ordered this, uh, we had this dish called the New Orleans and it had tasso ham and chicken and stuff and a cream sauce with linguine, I can still remember how to make it. And uh, this guy comes in and orders it extra hot. He's like, I want it. I keep hitting my pocket. He's like, I want it super spicy. Okay, fine. Brings it back, I go back, I get the cayenne pepper, I get some other things in there, whip it up pretty hot, because you get scared to send stuff out too hot, right? Well, he sends it back. He's like, it's not hot enough. I'm like, okay, fine, you know? Put some more stuff in there, send it back out, and I had taken a taste of it, and even I was kind of like, whoa, this is pretty spicy. Comes back again. At this point, this is a damn challenge. I want to make this guy cry. So we like put as much, we, we like did every, th what was supposed to be like a cream-based sauce, this dish went out like red. It was like bright red. Well, the waitress takes it out and everything, and she said that she watched him take a bite, and he was like, yeah, this is good, this is good. Well, she comes back like five minutes later and is like, I need to see the GM. I'm like, why? He's like, the guy's sitting in the booth crying, and he wants somebody to help him. And I'm like, are you serious and I go out there and sure enough he's got his head back and he's got one of our napkins like pulled over his head and he's like sitting there trying to cool down and everything it was just <laughs> but he asked for it you know third third time back I'm lighting you up every way shape or form I can I think I put like two tablespoons of cayenne pepper inside like one dish and that cayenne pepper is nasty it'll rip you up so generally first time after but after that you start getting aggravated yes sir so, so you mentioned you know, tips come out of the waitresses when the, the back screws out of them. You know, coming from, you know, having that background experience, you know, how, how do you handle that then? You know, because most people, myself probably included, look at the tips as, you know, that's what they, they're earning. You know, better waitresses get better tips. Right. Better service get better tips. So when it's not their fault, how do you get handled? So whenever I go out, I watch a waitress. You can always tell by the waitress or the waiter that's where, helping you. So if, 
if they walk past your table and you see them look down and all of a sudden they look back to the kitchen, they take off running, I know right there that the kitchen's probably screwing up. When I see a waitress that's going around talking to people and not really paying attention, because if it's a waiter or a waitress that cares about the food and they know it's running long because of the kitchen, they're always watching the kitchen. They're listening for somebody yelling for a runner or whatever. If it's a waitress or waiter that you know takes your order, then goes out and smokes half a cigarette, then goes in and puts in your order, you can tell by the body language and the way that they're generally waiting on your table. If my food's late and I feel like I've been treated, I always, I always say I want to be treated like a king. And that's not necessarily waiting on me every hand and foot or on something, but just being nice. Treat me like I matter in your world. If, if somebody's still doing that and the food takes a while to get out, I still tip at least 20% because I know most of the time it's not that waiter or waitress's problem, but I also will get the GM or I'll get the manager on duty. And I won't yell at them, but I'll be like, hey, your kitchen, you know, we came here for lunch, we came here for dinner, we waited 45 minutes to get an app, that, you know, whatever. And I'm always nice to them. And the other thing is, is that if you're nice to them and you also don't go into it expecting something, they'll generally take a hell of a lot better care of you than somebody It's all, because you get everybody that just wants to scream and yell. And these people get screamed and yelled at all the time, that's not going to make a difference to them. So basically, I still tip 20% on pretty much everything unless I see that it's a waiter or waitress that isn't taking care of me and they've already set my expectation low so they're getting 10% or 15 so yes ma'am what's a bad day for a chef what does that mean? a bad day for a chef is when you get your entire crew busted by INS <laughs> had that happen um, <clears throat> so <laughs> a bad day for a chef generally involves one, people not showing up. Because you're running a line, maybe at a, a place where you're doing four or 500 covers, and you're doing it with only six to 10 people back there. If you lose one or two people um, on a shift, you're generally, you're, you're screwed. You're running around and you're cooking. I've done before where I'm running a saute station and I'm expediting on a Sunday night because two cooks didn't show up and I'm running around all day long, doing you know back and forth cooking and calling out orders. Um, produce being late. Oh man, produce, my fish, my, my meat not showing up on time. Time, that's horrible. Um, kitchen catching on fire. That's always bad. When that happens, really, really bad. When, when the powder systems go off into the hoods, you shut down and you can't reopen until it's been completely clean. I've had that happen before. And also losing power in the middle of uh, dinner service on a Friday when it's like 97 degrees out in Columbus, Ohio, and you still got to get everything out because people are sitting in the dining room waiting. That's massive because you're talking 100, 110 degrees, and then you're running your stoves and everything with no hood system. So so the kitchen will get up to 130, 140 degrees and nothing flat, and you still got to try to push through dinner service. So those, those are some examples. So living in Arizona, yeah, I, I've, yeah, I've, uh, I've, I can give you all kinds of stories about bad days for a chef. Yeah, watching your sous chef cut off his finger into on a on a Hobart. Yeah, I've seen that happen. So <laughs> anybody else? Let me look down through the questions here. See. Any of them interest you? Yeah, let's see. Um, what's the hardest part of being a chef? Um, living the life. That that would be, I would say, one of them. If you're if you care about what you're doing and you're busting your butt at what you're doing, it's it's a hard life to live. You work a lot of hours. Um, our, when I first got into management, we were salaried and we were scheduled 55 hours a week. We made a joke because it was a 55 restaurant group and you were scheduled 55 hours a week, <laughs> but you would generally work when I was executive chef, I would probably work 75 to 80 hours a week. And then uh, when I was opening restaurants, it would be nothing for us to get a hotel room as close as possible because we would work about 100 hours a week for seven to eight weeks until we'd be open. And that, that was, the, living the life is sometimes really tough. Um, and if you have any kind of addiction behaviors, it's definitely not an industry I recommend anybody go into. That's one of the reasons why I got out. I realized I was drinking way too much and everything. And everybody else had Friday, Saturday night to go have fun and all I did was feed everybody food so I, that was one of the reasons I got out of it. Um, I think I like also the ideal relationship between a chef and an owner of a restaurant. Um, one of the problems I've always had with owners and, with, and I also would look at it as GMs because GMs are usually the owner unless you're working someplace where somebody can hire out a full-time GM, which a lot of restaurants don't ever get to that. They'll have front of house managers and they'll have the chef and the sous chefs, but they'll never hire out that GM. The, the restaurant owner usually stay there. Um, getting people used to the fact that you got to listen to your, they got to listen to your customers. A lot of people open up restaurants saying, I'm going to be the best steakhouse. I'm going to be the best uh, brew pub. I'm going 
going to be the best blah. And then it turns out that that kind of clientele isn't filtering into the restaurant. You need to listen to your clients. Um, restaurants are listen to your customers. Restaurants is one of the one industry that more places fail at in the first year than any other any other industry in the U.S. Also, you don't make money in restaurants for at least your first year. If you're turning a profit after your first year thumbs up to you, you've done a great job. It's usually two to three years before you start turning a good profit out of a restaurant. Um, you get GMs and you get owners that had this grand vision of when they open this place and they want to stick with this vision. You can do that, but you have to tweak it. I mean, you have to listen to your customers and realize that maybe the atmosphere is good, but this food isn't serving people and it's not making people happy. Too many times people stick to their guns on that, that what their concept of the restaurant was going to be, and sure enough, a year and a half later, they're shutting down and during that time, they, they squandered away a million dollars. I've seen that happen so many times. You got a question, Scott? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, anybody else got any questions? No. Yeah. Well, what kind of things do you, did you take away from that experience that you feel like you're still using today? Um, work ethic is one of them. Uh, I, I was raised by... Um, coal miners. My, my, my family is from West Virginia. They're coal miners. They're used to working hard. And I got taught at a really young age to work hard. And I think that restaurants help that. When you're 18, 19 years old and you're already working 60 hours a week for a salary, you, it, it kind of changes your mindset. I meet a lot of people now that are young coming up through. And also I met a lot of people that you know I was hiring on that they don't know what it's like to work. And they don't know, you know, they're used to 40 hours or you're used to 8 to 5. Um, I learned... I learned that you got to work your, you got to work your butt off if you want something and you got to be uncomfortable sometimes doing it cuz working in a kitchen wearing wearing pant you know sweating your butt off and you know dressing you go home and you're covered in dressing and everything else I mean you, you learn real quick that you know some of these jobs that people complain about having and everything, they, they really aren't that bad. You gotta work for what you want. That, that's the one biggest thing I look at with restaurants. And plus, I learned a lot of business experience very early because when I was a sous chef, I ended up opening a restaurant, I had to learn numbers. I had to learn budgeting for you know buying things to open a restaurant and things like that. So I think that I learned a lot of things like that really early in my career because of, because of restaurant industry. Also, you learn to deal with stress. Uh, restaurants is probably one of the most stressful environments you can be in. When, when, you're, when your food's getting backed up in the kitchen and everybody's screaming at you and waitresses are yelling and everything, you learn how to deal with stress and how to, how to make quick decisions and stick behind them. Because in a kitchen, when you're talking about 10, 15 minutes to get something out to a table, when you run out of something, you think about a workaround and you implement it in a matter of a couple minutes. There's no thinking about, is this the best solution possible or anything for that? You react, and if it's wrong, you react even quicker to try to fix it. So. Yes, ma'am. I don't even know quite how to articulate the question. You, you, you obviously organize. Uh, you have you have the ability to to look and get facts and make things happen. But you talked about struggling in school. Mm -hmm. Where where's the gap? Well, how is it that someone with your gifts um, is missing it in the, in the school? One, one was schools couldn't deal with my temperament. And my wife can actually attest to this when she met me 10 years ago I was a, I was a lot more angry person and I and I would I had a I had a short short fuse and I'd blow up on things but, do you but think also you trying to fit into the school system I think that the school system didn't have any way to try to help me then I mean now mind you I'm 35 so we're talking about you know back in the 80s and early 90s kind of thing and I was very interested in computers then. That's really what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to do that for a living, but the idea of what I would have to go through to get to college at that point, what I would have, because everything was so structured. Also, I'm very fidgety. I, I talk all the time. I, I'm very high strung. And it wasn't so much always my anger or my temperament, but I needed something to keep me involved. And there were no program. Yeah, there, there were no programs at all when I was in school that kind of did that. There was no programs that kept me interested or kept me engaged. It was all about book work. It's all about sitting down and following. And for everything computer related at the time, that's what it was. There, there were some of us that were, you know, met together and we, we were actually programming and writing some of our own little games and stuff like that on the IBM PCs and the old 486s back then. But 
in the way of schooling and being able to have, have a program that would help harness that and help me build through that, everybody told me, as long as your attitude's like this, you're never gonna make it. So that's kind of, you know, and that's why I ended up getting held back a year was because of some issues that happened. And that's when I was like, I gotta find something else that excites me. And Kitchens was what it was because I could be up, I could be moving, I could be interactive. and. Partly also my temperament helped play into dealing with the stress, dealing with you know things going bad. I, I would just jump in. I don't sit back and go, oh, why is this happening? Jump in, try to fix it. And a lot of that was because of my temperament. So I, I think that's why I made that change into restaurants. I miss it still today. I miss the chaotic pace of it. But uh, I also, I don't miss working that many hours. But you found a way in the computer world to, to do that kind of tactile energy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it, it took me a while to realize that. I, I think that even my first job, you know, doing tech support, because I was first a tech support guy, then I was a network administrator, and then I became a, um, I actually did what, hardware engineering for a year and a half, um, and then I actually went into writing software. And during that whole time, I was able to, it, one of the things was, is I was able to, I kept changing what I was doing, and that kept me really involved, and it was very hands-on. But also, I think that the, the culture had changed during that six, seven years that I was in restaurants, the culture had changed a little bit to where I was able to get in the door without having to go to school and still going through all those because I've never gone to school a day in my life. I've never been to college a day in my life. So <laughs> thank you. Anybody else got questions? Yeah. You still cook? Oh I still cook. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I still cook quite I don't cook as much. Uh, just because I stay pretty busy with community and a lot of things that I do, um, but I still, uh, I still do cook up a lot, and uh, I've been known to do some big dinners. And uh, haven't done a dinner in a while, but uh, uh, I got the grills at home. I'm a big grill fan. I think I have three or four grills sent at home right now, and I'm always I'm cooking out on those. And then, of course, I've got all the all the gadgets, the KitchenAid mixer, and all that kind of stuff sent at home. And I I've been known to throw together some deals. You know, every now and then I'll get something and be like, oh, let's go get a side of salmon and cut it up, or let's you know I, I'll pick up a beef tenderloin and bring it home and stuff it or throw it in the oven or do things like that. So I still still make my own sauces sometimes at home. I sometimes make my own stocks at home when I do dinners. So, But I can't cook a grilled cheese. <laughs> Always screw them up. Cannot do a grilled cheese to save my life. It's kind of funny. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you.